Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for those of you who are joining us online or by broadcast. Again, Pastor Jeremy is online to minister to your needs, to pray for you, and to make sure that your prayer requests are covered by our prayer team. So thank you so much. Today, we rejoice and we talk about the resurrection in the context of when death died. But before I get into that, let me just give you a heads up about next week. Even though this is a standalone message, next week, the Lord willing, I'll begin a brand new series entitled Happily Ever After. And, and, and if you could just indulge me for just a moment, let me just preach that series in one sentence, would you? God created you and started writing your story, and it began with Once Upon a Time. And no matter what happens in the pages in between, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it will end with, and they lived happily ever after. Now, that's good news. We're going to talk about the overcoming life, overcoming trouble, overcoming trees, and overcoming tests. And I'm thankful for God's word. You know, we've been on a journey, haven't we? 2021, journey through the word with the Word, to hear from the Word. And today, today is no exception. But let me begin by telling you the story of a young couple, a couple who were both called to education. So after their degree, they both got a job in public school and began teaching. On New Year's Eve, they were struggling. They were struggling with the fact that he had the virus and wasn't doing very well, he had missed all of the holidays, and now it was New Year's Eve, and this young teacher, pregnant with her third child, stayed up at night and watched the ball drop. And as it dropped, she had these thoughts. The world is in such turmoil. There's a sexual revolution that's happening that's, that's causing our values to be turned upside down. The political realm is in so much upheaval and the culture is contrary and counter to everything we believe. We're not even able to preach God in the schools anymore. And she was very discouraged, very depressed and very despondent, and as the ball dropped, she had this thought, what kind of world will my children live in? What's happening? Is God in control? And then she thought, I don't know if life is worth living. At that moment, God heard her cry, and something happened that changed everything. When we think about the resurrection, my mind goes to John chapter 11 to begin with. During Lazarus' death, when Jesus approached Mary and Martha, and he said these words to them, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then he seems to contradict himself, and he goes on to say, listen, whoever believes in me will never die. But you see, it's no contradiction at all. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection, the very last exhale that you make on this earth, you will inhale the breath of heaven, your very next breath. The fact is, you will never cease to exist. Not for one moment. Because the resurrection, death, died. And that is incredible hope that we have. You know, besides the, the story of the resurrection that's in the Gospels that I quoted from a few minutes ago, the most incredible and exhaustive chapter on the resurrection in the Bible is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
And it just so happens that those of you who are journey with us reading the Bible through, you read that passage in that chapter this past week. How appropriate. And so that's going to be our focus today, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But before we get into our focus scripture, let's just take a journey through that chapter. Let's just walk through the pages of that chapter and discover what Paul said about the resurrection. In verses 1 through 11, he talks about the evidence of the resurrection. He says that Jesus appeared to the women. He appeared to Simon Peter. He appeared to the disciples. And he appeared to over 500 people at once. He says most of them, only a few of them have died at the time of this writing. He appeared to James, his half-brother. And finally, Paul says, he appeared to me as one born out of season. So Paul lays out the evidence of the resurrection. Did you know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most documented ancient event that the Romans documented it, that the Jewish historians documented it, that the scriptures documented it? It is absolutely indisputable that the grave was empty. And Paul lays out these evidences. And then in verses 12 through 19, he plays the what-if game. You ever play the what-if game? He says, look, 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 what if it didn't happen? What if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead? What then? He said, then our preaching is vain. Everything that we believe is vain. Our lives are vain. And we are to be pitied among anybody that lives on the planet. But it's not so. And then he lays out in verses 20 through 28 the, the doctrine of the first fruits. He says that, that Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. He points back to the Passover. He says, you all know that in the Passover, a lamb is slain. And after the lamb is slain, a priest blows the horn at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, signifying that the spotless lamb is slain and that sins are covered. Then, he says, after the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, a new festival begins. It's the festival of the first fruits. It is when the farmers bring in the harvest, they bring in the sheaves, now, that's where that song comes from, bringing in the sheaves. It's true. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in. Thank you. So on that day, on the first day of the week, right after Passover, the priest waves the first fruits of the harvest, signifying that this harvest belongs to God. Then he says, on Passover, Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb, was crucified. And at 3 o'clock, precisely at the moment that Jesus cried out, it is finished, the priest blew the trumpet, signifying that the spotless lamb had been crucified, that the spotless lamb had been sacrificed, and that sins are now covered. Then, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the first fruits of the resurrection came out of that tomb. Death had died. And it's like he's waving to God, I am the first fruits and the harvest follows. You are the harvest that Jesus Christ waved the first fruits to God for. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ, who believes the gospel, will be raised from the dead, those who have died in him. And that's what he said. And then in verses uh, 34 through 40, or, or 29 through 35, he talks about uh, the motivation that we have because of the resurrection. He basically said this, look, because of the resurrection, you need to crawl up out of the tomb of your daily troubles and realize a better day is coming. You don't have to fall in the hole of the troubles of today because tomorrow the resurrection happens. And he said, everything that we do should be motivated by the fact that one of these days we are going to be raised from the dead. We are going to be like him and we are going to have eternal life. And then finally, 
in verses 35 through 49, he talks about the reality of the resurrection. He says that the same body that Jesus Christ died in is the same body that he was raised in. Though he looked different, though he was glorified, though he was unrecognizable, it's the same body. And in the same way, he said, the same body that you live in and die in will be the same body that is raised from the dead. It won't look like you, but it will be you. And so he talks about this. And he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I pray that my whole body, my soul, and my spirit will be presented to God on that day. Job puts it this way. Though the worms eat my flesh, yet in my flesh I will see God, for my Redeemer lives. It is the same body that God has given us that will be raised from the dead. And it's absolutely incredible. And that brings us now to verse 50, which is our focus for this morning. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, this very familiar story, it's easy for us to think, oh, we know that story, so let's just check out. But Holy Spirit, I pray that you would quicken our minds, our eyes, our ears. Help us, Lord, to gain new insight into the power of the resurrection and be motivated for holy living because of it. Jesus, speak to us through your spirit today, we pray. Amen and amen. Oh, Sigmund Freud was the first one that ever made a living studying human behavior. When it came to death, he made this statement regarding people's behavior and their thoughts regarding death. He said, and finally, there is the painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has yet been found, nor probably ever will. Oh, Sig was wrong. He was wrong. But most people on the planet believe this. Most people on the planet don't have hope. Most people on the planet today haven't accepted the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Most people think that death is the end. But that's not true. That's not true with me. That's not true with most of you. That's not true with people who are watching online or by broadcast. People who believe in Jesus Christ and have accepted the word of God as truth believe in the power of the resurrection, and we have hope. Hope like our forefathers had. Many of the people who founded this country had that same hope. Ben Franklin's words are my favorite. He, he actually wrote his epitaph long before he died. And that very epitaph is on his marker today. Look at it. The body of Benjamin Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out, stripped of its lettering and gilding. 
lies here food for worms. But the work will not be lost, for it will appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. That is the most wonderful description of the resurrection I think that I've ever seen on anyone's epitaph. God bless Benjamin Franklin. Today, let's talk about several things regarding the, the resurrection. Let's talk about the change. Let's talk about the conquest. Let's talk about the credit. And let's talk about the challenge. First of all, the change. Why? When? How? Why the change? Because if you look in the mirror, you have discovered already gravity has come. We are in these bodies and we are dying. These bodies have not been created to last through eternity. And so why is that it's necessary for us to be changed? It's necessary for this immortal to put on immortality in order to enjoy eternity. It's absolutely necessary. Now, how or when is it going to happen? Well, when is it going to happen is at the last trump. This is not talking about the trump that John writes about in Revelation, the last trumpet of the judgment. Rather, it's talking about the trump of God. The trump of God when Jesus Christ comes back. A trumpet will sound. Paul puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, look, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, so also Jesus will bring with him those who have died in the faith, those who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here's what I know, that when your loved one and my loved one breathe their last breath on this earth and their first breath of heaven, they were given a temporal, supernatural, recognizable, functioning body and it's that temporal supernatural functioning recognizable body that will return with Jesus when he comes because when he comes their earthly body will be recreated when is it going to happen it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye the very smallest discernible amount of time that exists it's going to be instantaneously instant, if I could just put it that way. That we are going to be recreated, that all of the cells, all of the DNA, all of the atoms of our body will come together out of the dust, out of the ashes, out of the fish food for those who died in the ocean. Everyone who has ever died, God's going to bring their atoms together and instantaneously, instant, instantly, he is going to recreate them into a incorruptible body so that the redeemed spirits and souls of those who are with Jesus will join instantly their redeemed bodies. And, and I got to wonder, why does God do this? Why, why can't he just let us, leave us in these bodies that we have when we die? Why does he have to redeem the old flesh? Why does he have to bring atoms from all over the world together and recreate out of the same atoms that we were born with. Why? And I've got an answer for that. Because he can. <laughs> and because it's his plan. You know, sometimes we just need to just leave the why questions alone and just accept the fact that God is God. And since he's God, he's God. And if the Bible says it, that's the way it is. If we can figure out God, that reduces God to the lowest level of our intellect. I don't know about you, but I serve a God who is smarter than I am, and I'm happy to do so. 
But this is when it's going to happen. But not only those who have died, the Bible talks about the conquest. When death is swallowed up in victory. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 25. He says that death is swallowed up in victory when the corruptible becomes incorruptible. And the mortal becomes immortalized. That is, the corruptible are those who have died. The mortal are those who are alive. At this moment, you and I are alive. And if Jesus were to come back in the next moment, every one of our loved ones and friends who have died in Christ will be instantaneously, instantly recreated just like that. And we, which are alive and remain, shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal will put on immortality. And so those two groups, the corrupt who have died and the mortal who are still alive, will be instantly given these amazing overcoming, ready for eternity, supernatural, recognizable bodies. It will be you and all that you are inside of a body that's like Christ. Because the Bible says when that happens, we will see him face to face because we will be like him. That is absolutely incredible. And that is our hope. And when that happens, death will be swallowed up in victory. The question is, who gets the credit for that? Jesus gets the credit for that. Because death is swallowed up in victory, it causes and begs this question, death, where is your sting? And if death could answer, he would answer like a bee. You know, some bees, especially the honeybee, have these barb stings. So when the honeybee stings and other bees sting you with these barb stingers, then the stinger leaves their body and the venom leaves their body and they have to fly away from their stinger and they leave their stinger inside of us. But bad news for the bee, it dies. It dies. And so when we ask death, death Where is your sting? (laughs) He says, I left it in Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, sin died. And when Jesus rose from the dead, death died. Death has no more sting. Grave has no more victory because the stinger was left in Jesus Christ and he rose from the dead and now death has no power. And so, if Jesus tarries and we're laying on our deathbed and death comes for us, we can look at him with courage and say, death, you may be here, you may have rattled my body with disease and I may breathe my last breath on this earth, but you have no sting, you have no power over me because the very next breath I take will be in the presence of Jesus Christ. How did that happen? All credit and glory belong to Jesus Christ our Lord. That is what he accomplished for us because he loves us so much he wants to spend eternity with us. What hope? That brings me to the last point, the challenge. The challenge is since we have that hope, we are to remain steadfast no matter what this culture says. Counterculture, cancel culture, no matter what this culture says that we live in, we will remain steadfast to our faith because the truth is God's Word. We will remain immovable. Nothing can shake our faith, not death, not life, not not trouble, not trial. We will remain immovable in our faith in Jesus Christ because we understand the truth of His Word. And because it's deep within us, because like Pastor Brandon said, that old man has become alive again by the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We will remain immovable. And finally, he says, be motivated to continue to do good works. Be motivated to share your story. Be motivated to work for the Lord. Because your work is not in vain. One of these days... And your glorified body 
ready for eternity. You will face Jesus face to face, and he will reward you for all the good things that you have done for people that he loves so much. Even a cool drink of water, he said, will not lose its reward. And so this resurrection challenges us to live holy lives. It challenges us to crawl out of the grave of today's trouble and look forward to that hope that we have tomorrow. When we are transformed or when we are resurrected, when we are in the face and in the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that question that Jesus asked Mary and Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe? believe this. Would you stand with me, please? If you believe this and you have acted on the truth and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then as surely as you stand here today, there will come a day when you will become immortal and you will be like him for all eternity the very essence of you and the very essence of a brand new created body Hmm. but sad to say there are people who have not yet believed that truth you also will stand before Jesus. Revelation talks about the great white throne judgment. And every person whose name is not found in the Lamb's book of life will stand before Jesus and answer this question. Why didn't you believe it? Why? Why didn't you accept the free gift of my grace when you had the opportunity? Is it because you wanted to live your few lives on the earth and do your own thing? Is it because you couldn't ask, answer all the why questions and you couldn't understand God? Why? Why would you deny and, and, and disregard so great a salvation? I can't, I can't comprehend what anyone will say when they see Jesus face to face and give a reason as to why they would not accept his incredible, amazing love. But that's in the future. Today is an opportunity for those who are watching online or by broadcast or in this room to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you don't know him, would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you don't know Jesus and you haven't placed your faith in him, then death still has a hold of you. And when you face Jesus, and your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, after you give the reason why, You will be thrown into the lake of fire, and it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus did everything he could to make sure it doesn't have to be that way. So all you have to do is very simple. With childlike faith, just say, Jesus, I choose to believe the Scripture. I choose to believe that the Word of God is true and that I was born into sin, dead in my sin. I can't do enough to merit eternal life. And I believe what the pastor said today, that you died for me, that you rose rose again, and that you're coming back, and I want to be ready. If you want to dedicate your life to him, if you want to consecrate your life to him, if you want to give your life to him, or even rededicate your life to him, All you have to do is say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. 
I choose to serve you for the rest of my days. I want to know you, Lord. I want to have a relationship with you, Jesus. I want to spend eternity alive and in your presence and enjoy all the promises that you have given us. All you have to do is ask the Lord to forgive you. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you're here this morning and you need a Savior, and you pray that prayer, just raise your hand right where you're standing. Anyone in the room, commit your life to the Lord, recommit your life to the Lord. Raise it up. Raise your hand. Thank you. Father, I thank you for those who have committed in this room and those who have committed online or by broadcast to serve you. I thank you for so great a salvation. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to choose life and to live forever. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. As the ball dropped, that lady who was pregnant with her third child, that teacher who was so distraught, was overwhelmed by the supernatural assurance that God was in control, that his word was true, and that everything was going to be okay. Her husband made it through the virus and the week before Easter her child was born and as she picked up that baby she thought about that night when she was so despondent so discouraged because John F. Kennedy had just been assassinated the sexual revolution was in full force. They had just taken prayer and Bible reading out of school. And the tension in the culture was running at an all-time high. But it was Easter. And once again, she was overwhelmed by this assurance that God was in control and everything would be okay. And so Gloria told her husband, Bill, something's coming to me. And she took a pen and she wrote these words. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. The greater still the calm assurance we can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone and because I know he holds the future life is worth living just because he lives they sang that together in the church other churches opened up they sang again and in 1967 they both left their teaching careers and started out in a new season of life in full-time ministry. And Bill and Gary, uh, Bill and Gloria Gaither, to this day, have made a huge impact. And this song is probably sung in many, many churches on this day. And it all started with the realization that God has given us supernatural peace in troubled times because of the resurrection. Brandon's going to sing this song. And as he does, I want you to reflect on any anxiety or fear or trouble that you may be going through. And I want you to release it to God and allow the power of the Holy Spirit to just envelop your body, your soul, and your spirit and remind you that there is a God in heaven who is in control of this very day. And it's because he lives that we have that assurance. Would you sing it, Pastor? I sit here, son. They call him Jesus. 
But greater still is the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Be Father, I thank you, Lord, for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for knowing our thoughts. I thank you, Lord, for reminding us most of all that because you have risen, you have given us hope beyond what this world can even comprehend. And I thank you, Lord, that all of us have an incredible future because you have prepared us, prepared it for us. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you love him, church? He's good to us, isn't he? Love one another. As I have loved you, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, even so come, Lord Jesus. God bless you.